Okay, good morning everyone. We're going to kick off. So welcome everybody in the room this morning and welcome to everyone online. We've got lots of people online and lots of people here, which is wonderful. So questions, of course, we juggle between the two, the audience here in the room and the audience of uh, people who are in their offices and wherever they are uh, across the UK. Um, so lots and lots of questions, please, because all of you know who have been before, and for those of you that are new, um, it's the questions which generate the most fun, really, and the most learning in terms of the case presentations um, and our two um, speakers as well. So I'm going to hand over to this morning's chairs. As I say, just to remind you, we've got some guest speakers if you look at your timetable, uh, and then we've also got our case presentations, and the case presentations really encouraging lots of questions. Our guest speakers also have question time at the end. So again, please don't be shy. The questions are the most important bit of the day. Okay, um, so I'm going to hand over now to Anjali Armin and to Arthur Dalton, who are those of you in the room sitting behind me who are our chairs this morning's session. Good morning. <clears throat> um, we are very lucky to have Dr. Annie Powell here today. Dr. Powell is a consultant endocrinologist at the Royal Sussex County Hospital and an honorary clinical senior lecturer at the Brighton and Sussex Medical School. A specialist in interest in clinical endocrine care of teenagers and young adults, and we very much look forward to her talk entitled What is the Role of the Transitional Endocrine Clinic for Young People with Pituitary Conditions? transferring the pediatric to adult services. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And um, thanks very much to Eve and to Quinn for inviting me today. Um, so these are the topics that I'm going to cover. So we're going to think about um, transition, and as I say, we're talking about transition from pediatric to adult services here. We'll think a bit about um, parents, patients, and the, the sort of endocrine team in those clinics. Um, we'll think about pituitary conditions in teens and young adults ways that we reassess pituitary function in transition, um, some of the challenges, and I'll just share at the end a few cases as examples. Um, so I think even if you don't do or don't end up doing transitional endocrine clinics, you will all look after young people coming through to adult services, so hopefully there will be some, some relevance to everybody. Um, so we were going to do a quick question just to gauge people's experience, I guess. Um, so negligible sounds a bit um, rude, but anyway, so <laughs> maybe just gauge your own experience of these clinics and then I'll just have a feel for, for what people have. Okay, I'm just going to nudge you along, so I've given you 10 seconds to respond. Uh, thank you for those of you who voted, and then we'll just have a look. Okay. So, gosh, that's very really interesting. That is very interesting, and it's useful to know at this stage. So, great, thank you. And then there's just one more Mentimeter question. Um, so, this question is um, When do you feel you became an adult? So, I've given some choices in the <laughs> ages. Um, we may need to choose the age that's sort of the closest approximation. So, we'll just um, hope you'll be able to make that to the next question. We will indeed. So, just to say, so for this one, very variable experience, which is really excellent in terms of where Anna's talk will be going. And then our next question, uh, as Anna says, is a bit like, when do you feel you're middle-aged? And that changes as you approach middle age. So um, when do you feel you become an adult? If you vote away, um, and um, we'll look, have a look at the um, answers in a minute, but you can see at the bottom, at 16, at 18, at 21, at 25 or 30 plus. And this is a personal thing. I don't want the general feel. This is when did you personally become an adult? Oh, goodness. <laughs> Gosh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bell shaped curve. It's a bell shaped curve. Yeah. Bell -shaped curve. <laughs> okay. I think this is important. The reason I mean I know it's it's um the reason I put this in here is I think sometimes we expect too much of our young adults, um, particularly in terms of healthcare. Um, and so I think it's just helpful sometimes to reflect on one's own personal life in terms of an adulthood. Good. So um, just a few sort of definitions. So um, transition in this context is the process of planning, preparing and moving on from children's to adult health care for those patients who will need that sort of continued care. And it is meant to be a, a gradual and dynamic process. So you're not just dumped from the paediatric clinic into the adult clinic. So typically, um, this does happen between the ages of 16 to 18. Um, there is obviously or should always be flexibility, so for different um, 
uh, individuals who can choose a developmentally appropriate age. But even for those um, you know, who have, for example, learning disabilities, there's a limit to the amount of time that they can stay in a, in a paediatric setting. So they do at some stage have to be transitioned over to the adult clinic. There's also this concept of young adulthood, which I think is really important and probably underserved in, in healthcare in the sense that we are sort of young adults or emerging adults till you know, 2025 and possibly as you saw from the graph, some of us being even, even older than that. So the aims of this process, obviously you want to optimize health outcomes for the individual. You want to try and ensure continuity of care. And, and that really helps to reduce the rate of loss to follow up between paediatric and adult clinics. So if they've already met the team that are going to be following them up in adulthood in a paediatric setting and then have the reassurance that they'll meet the same people in the adult clinic, I think that does something towards improving uh, the patient experience and, and engagement with the service. So if we think about the context of the young person, first of all, um, so obviously this is by definition a new team. So you need to make sure that they know how to contact their new team. Um, and that hopefully will include an endocrine nurse specialist. You are sort of encouraging the young person to develop more autonomy and independence, obviously sort of as appropriate for their age and their situation. So ways that you can help this. So treatment summaries or care plans can be really helpful, sort of individualized to the patient. Just discussing their diagnosis. So some, uh, some people will know an awful lot about their diagnosis and some people really quite little even at, at you know, sort of um, teenage years. It is, as I say, a gradual process. So you want to reassure the young person that they can still bring a parent, carer or close friend to their appointments. They don't, again, suddenly have to be coming by themselves. But equally, they may want that person to leave for part of the consultation and that's fine. So you'll often, as you get to know them, give them the option you know, mum or dad may come in for the beginning bit, then you say, you know, would you like mum and dad just to wait in the waiting area for a bit while we chat a bit more? Obviously, you're going to try and um, encourage them to ask questions, you're going to try and answer the questions. And again, I think I was encouraging people to bring a list because we all know it's so easy just to forget, um, you know, as soon as you arrive in a consulting room, all the things that you wanted to ask. You want to be quite explicit about why they need ongoing follow up. So, for example, some young people feel, well, you know, Gone through puberty, I've grown. Why would I need sort of continued follow up? So, you need to really share that information. Remember that these young people have lived with their condition for as long as they've been diagnosed, as long as they've had it. You need to acknowledge their expertise in it. You know, try to avoid patronizing people, find out what they know, and really sort of um, reinforce their knowledge of their own condition. Um, it's important that they start to learn how to self manage their medication. Um, so this includes knowing what their tablets are, when they should be taking them, but also really quite basic things that parents or carers might have been helping with, like when and how to get more supplies, you know, how to get a repeat prescription, how to get to the pharmacist. And you will, of course, particularly in the context of hydrocortisone treatment, be discussing medical alert bracelets or, or equivalents, and we'll come to that. So I think sometimes you don't want the clinic to be like a sort of um, an inquisition for them, but you can gently say, you know, just tell me a bit about your medication. What do you take? When do you take it? And that's quite useful because you can get a spectrum from somebody who literally just takes what their parents have put in the pots each day to somebody who's able to really sort of clearly explain to you what the medications are, what the doses are, what the sick day rules are. And also, um, young people need to understand appointments. And for any of us who've actually been patients, you'll know it's a total nightmare in terms of appointments, bookings, remembering how to, how to get where to go, how to book in, all of those things can seem really daunting. So you need to try and just um, help people along in terms of their, their transition. And very important as well, urgent or emergency care and treatment. So for young people who've presented with emergencies to a paediatric a &E in their own center they're often you know quite well known they'll have what's called a patient passport it's quite a small a &E. the whole system is quite straightforward i think we'll certainly be speaking for brighton but maybe for other AEs, that is really not the experience they'll get in an adult a &E. so you need to try to sort of again as much as one can smooth that process and that may be things like making sure that they've got the nhs steward emergency card that they can present to a triage uh, triage nurse um, but you know that sort of uh, discussion is really important so thinking a bit about support and safety for teens and young adults, so I'm focusing a bit on the kind of human side of things, and I can make no apologies for this, because you can be the best expert in hormones, but unless you can do the sort of human bit, as in all of endocrinology, you're not going to, to do the best for your, for your patients. So you've probably heard of this HEADS um, 
which is just a kind of framework really to structure a holistic consultation with a young person. So you're thinking through their home environment, uh, education, employment, activities, what they like doing, drugs, sexuality, suicide, depression. So it's not um, a questionnaire that you literally run through, you know, now we discuss this, now we're going to do drugs, now we're going to do sex, now we're going to do depression. No, you don't do it like that. But it's sort of you can start off who's at home with you, what are you up to at the moment. And I think it's really important, especially when you first meet the young person, to actually make that a conversation as you would with any other person. So if they tell you what they're doing, what their college is, you'd be interested in that as you would normally be interested in things so that you can just start to build a relationship. You need to remember you're meeting them, meeting them at a time of change for them as well. They'll often be moving on to new settings. They may be, um, you know, actually physically moving. And a lot of life changes are happening at the same time. At this time, I think it's really important that the young person starts to develop trusted friends in new environments. So, for example, if they're going away to university, that concept that they find a trusted friend that they can trust with the information about their health. So if they become poorly on a night out, somebody else knows you know, a little bit about what needs to be done. Because at this stage, the influence of peers starts to go up and the influence of family uh, generally starts to go down for sort of independent young adults. Medical alert, really important. I've just included a wonderful tattoo of a patient who said, I really don't need a medical alert because I've got this. And she had a, <laughs> an amazing tattoo that said she has type 1 diabetes. It's difficult. They are a bit stigmatising medical alert bracelets. And even the ones that the Pituitary Foundation produce, which are the sort of silicon wristbands, which I try and say to people, look, this is quite cool. And they look at me and think, well, you're old. That's really not cool. <laughs> but, um, you know, something like that is, is helpful. Again, for those of you who've got or, you know, no teenagers, you'll know that it's not helpful really to have discussions along the line of <clears throat> don't do this, never do this, don't do that, because it just, these things are going to happen. So I think the conversations are better framed, what to do if, so for example, what to do if you're drinking alcohol and you have DDAVP treatment. Um, just to recount one short story about that, so I was having this conversation with a patients, I was saying to him, look, you know, if you have five pints of lager, you need to let that, you know, water clear, you need to have a few good wheeze before you take the DD of AVP that night. And he said, mm, Dr. Khan, are you telling me I should be taking shots rather than um, pints? So I was like, um, this conversation is not going very well. Um, so, you know, it's that what to do if kind of conversation, which is important. So sex, contraception and fertility. So these are areas that often the paediatricians probably may not have sought to have broached. And this is really difficult, um, particularly because the discussions can seem contradictory. So what I mean by that is you may often be saying to somebody, you may not be spontaneously fertile. In the future, when you want to conceive, you may need help, but you mustn't assume that. You need to take contraceptive precautions. You, know, you need to take precautions against sexually transmitted diseases. And obviously you're having these conversations at a kind of age and appropriate time. So they're not really thinking about starting a family. And yet probably they do need to have some or start to gain some knowledge of what their fertility prospects might be. So these are always emotive discussions. And quite often you'll be caught up by the grief of the discussion because although the patient may have had these discussions with the paediatricians some time back, they've not really sort of logged it until now when that suddenly becomes much more relevant to them. And obviously they're embarrassed because it's like, you know, talking to your parents about sex. It's just not something you really want to do. And these are moments when it may be helpful if the parent or carer is with somebody that the parent or carer pops out for a bit so you can actually discuss things slightly more frankly. And as with all of our consultations, you're assuring your patient, obviously, that of non-judgmental listening, proper listening, confidentiality. And no wrong door is this idea that however young people approach healthcare, you don't sort of back them out again. So if they come to you and they're asking about something that isn't really within your remit, you do your very best to make the referral, to signpost, to find out how they do do that bit of healthcare, rather than just saying, you know, actually, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm your endocrinologist and that's all we can discuss today. So for the parent and carer, it's really just worry, 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 worry. So you've got a new team um, and often you've had a very long established and trusted relationship with the paediatric team. You lose what I would call the general paediatric support. So particularly for the young adults who've got multiple health problems, adult healthcare becomes really fragmented. They're having to go to a gastroenterologist, a neurologist, an endocrinologist. There's nobody really who can take that overview. And as I've said, the adult a &E hospital admission is a great deal more challenging. And if the young person is independent, then they may be moving away from home. So up till now, parents and carers have been fully informed, you know, even clinic letters or appointment letters go to the parent or carer at VEX, and now they're just going to be out of that loop. 
So for parents and carers, there's this difficult time, which is a natural thing of relinquishing control and maybe having doubts about the young person's basic life skills. And this happens to all of us, but it's even more exaggerated when you have a, a, a child who's got a chronic health condition. And also that awareness that this is a time for risk taking, exploring, experimenting, be that alcohol, drugs, sex, or even just going abroad for a kind of gap travel. And I think also for the, for the young adult who has significant learning or multiple physical disabilities, um, parents will be aware that there's a significant sort of difficulty and loss in terms of the opportunities for educational, so, social and psychological support that were available up to the age of 18 it can be a really abrupt transition. Um, and unless people have really sort of pokey elbows, it can be very hard to continue to get that support. So what about the sort of team in the room? I think it's sometimes helpful when you're doing a clinic to think, well, what, what are we doing here? What are we trying to do? So I think what we're doing is we review the sort of medical history to date in quite some detail, really, and make sure that we've really shared information. And I've put there by a psychosocial model, but it, it is that sort of understanding of how's the young person got to this point? Have they had a really tricky childhood, you know, and, and those sorts of things. But I equally feel personally as the adult endocrinologist, it's an opportunity for a fresh start, really, in a clean slate. So if my, you know, pediatric colleagues are saying, oh, this person's been a bit of a nightmare, they've never really taken their medication regularly. Well, you know, we've all done as it were, silly things in childhood. So I don't think you should necessarily assume that that's going to be an ongoing problem. You may need to be reassessing diagnoses sometimes, including diagnostic tests. So you really are sort of going back. Was the original diagnosis correct? Occasionally you'll undiagnose things. So for example, there may be a kind of slightly dodgy idiopathic AVP deficiency diagnosis way back when, and that may actually not uh, be an ongoing problem, may never have been a problem, strictly speaking. Um, you need to be thinking about, do they still have the condition? Does it need reassessing? So for example, isolated growth hormone deficiency, hypogonadism. So there's that period of, of reassessment. There may be new diagnostic tests indicated. So for example, since the initial diagnosis, maybe there's some newly available genetic tests that could be helpful. So I've put there some examples of the panels that are now available for hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, multiple pituitary hormone deficiencies. And it's a time obviously to review all of their medications. So it's quite a useful, again, pivot point to think about changes. So for example, I've just put some examples there, treatment of hypogonadism. So still some pediatric endocrine teams are quite sort of in favor of, of the um, ethanol estradiol type of pills. So you may be thinking about segueing to a more natural uh, HRT regimen. It may be a time for um, simplifying the regimen. So you may talk to the young person and they may say, I'm literally never gonna take anything three times a day. I haven't and I never will. And so, well, Grim will be pleased to hear this, but you know, that may be a time for saying, well, maybe once a day prednisolone is going to be simpler than a, a, a multi dose hydrocortisone. So it's just, you know, trying to really frame um, the, the plan in, in a, uh, an appropriate way. And this takes time. You can imagine this does take time. It takes, I would say, a good 30 minutes. And you need to trust and respect each other. You know, it's not a time for kind of silly point scoring or showing off how clever you are. It's really just, um, you know, taking the time to focus on the young person and their care going forwards. What about for the adult endocrinologist? Um, and again, thinking about, you know, what's going to happen going forwards. So it may be that adult follow-up won't, won't be required. That's quite rare in pituitary um, conditions, but sometimes you come, people, people do come through the transition endocrine clinic and you can be managed in primary care. As I said, it may be that they've grown out of the condition. So obviously growth hormone is used for a lot of reasons that are not growth hormone deficiency. So syndromic short stature, small for gestational age. So that's not going to require any ongoing follow-up. <coughs> I would say if you get the opportunity to be involved in this, it's a really rewarding experience. You do get the opportunity to build a relationship with patients over really quite an exciting time of their, of their lives. So then again, thinking what's likely to happen. So it may be that this is something that, although it will need initial adult follow-up, they will actually grow out of with time. So for example, delayed growth and puberty. It may be something that will come to an end at some point. So for example, a microcalactinoma. It may be a stable chronic condition. And I've given the example of charge association, which I'll discuss in a little bit more detail. Or it may be something where you're worried that things may progress or get worse. So for example, late effects of childhood cancer treatment or craniopharyngiomas where you're thinking that things might actually progress. So broadly speaking, in terms of thinking about <coughs> pituitary conditions in teens and young adults, um, so you've got a range of different sorts of hypopituitarism. So you've got what's sometimes called congenital or just delayed growth of puberty and uh, delayed growth in puberty. 
um, the functional hypothalamic hypogonadism, which again, we're quite familiar with, so that could be associated with an eating disorder or just the, the extreme athletes, the so-called relative energy deficiency in sport. Sometimes you see it less commonly these days, actually, because these conditions are so brilliantly managed now, but it used to be more common to see a functional hypothalamic hypogonadism in association with other chronic illnesses. Um, there may be congenital or syndromic hypopituitarism, so Kalman syndrome, which again we're familiar with in, in the adult world, charge association, I'll talk about sexual optic dysplasia, I'll talk a bit about, and the congenital hypopituitarism, again, I'll talk a bit about. It may be um, acquired hypopituitarism, but again, this is something we generally feel quite familiar with after surgery or radiotherapy, but there'll be a slightly larger number of, of young adults who've got late effects of, of treatment for other cancers in childhood. And you may be looking at an APP deficiency, for example, after uh, Langhans cell histocytosis. The panel on the right, which I've put as other hypothalamic pituitary things, are the things that I guess as adult endocrinologists we're quite sort of happy with, really. So consequences of pituitary surgery or radiotherapy, um, the standard pituitary adenomas, microprolactinomas. Obviously, in this age group, um, you are thinking that genetic causes are likely to be more uh, common, so you're going to have a much lower threshold for genetic testing. And in the NHS, you know, we can be quite lazy, really, and just tick the R217, and pretty much all children and young people with uh, pituitary adenomas will, will qualify for that test panel. Uh, craniopharyngiomas, again, we're familiar with rathkeclef cysts. Um, and then you do get other, obviously, supracellar tumours. So um, I've put there some examples, optic pathway gliomas, which can be associated with neurofibromatosis and, and germinomas. So just very briefly, and, and I wouldn't set myself up as an expert in any of these conditions, but just very briefly to discuss some of these slightly rarer conditions. So charge association is, as it says, an association. Um, the, the letters sort of help you to remember it, but even so I find I can literally never remember all the bits of it. Um, but it's got some bits which are non-endocrine, obviously you can see there to do with the heart, to do with the nasal passages. Um, you've got delayed growth in puberty, um, sometimes learning disabilities. Um, hearing problems, cranial nerve abnormalities, uh, cleft lip and palate and esophageal uh, atresia. The endocrine bit of that typically is hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism and also sometimes growth hormone deficiency. And I will discuss a patient with that condition at the end. Septo-optic dysplasia is again a sort of congenital um, condition with a typical triad, so you've got mid-line mid -line brain defects, uh, optic nerve hypoplasia, so visual impairment, and often sort of multiple pituitary hormone def deficiencies. So you may have um, growth hormone deficiency, or as I say, multiple deficiencies, plus or minus um, AVP deficiency. And this, um, in this situation, you may well get abnormalities of the pituitary uh, imaging. So um, you may see an absent stalk or an ectopic posterior pituitary. And they can also have features of hypothalamic dysfunction and sometimes of, of autistic spectrum disorder. Sometimes the gene is known and sometimes there's no clear genetic cause. And again, conditions that I'm not an expert in, but you, you will pick up the endocrine bits of. So Langerhans cell histiocytosis, uh, you know, it's a multi-system condition um, and there is some understanding of the genetics. From the pituitary perspective, the most typical finding is AVP deficiency and people can develop that before they're actually formally diagnosed. They can develop other pituitary hormone deficiencies and so sometimes you do see some progression. And you can see structural abnormalities in terms of an enhanced stalk and absent bright spot. So this is conditional, obviously at diagnosis is managed by you know, specialists in the condition. The endocrine bit is really just conventional hormone replacement therapy. Just with young people, it's worth knowing that non-smoking, obviously important to all of our patients, but particularly important to this group because they're in a very much heightened risk of lung disease if they smoke, even if the, the condition itself has sort of gone into remission. And then germ cell tumors such as germinomas, um, so these are the primary intracranial germ cell tumors. They are very rare. Um, the preponderance of men more than women, and they can present in childhood or adolescence. So you can get abnormalities of the imaging, so thickening of the stalk, and again, that can be progressive. Presentation can be quite variable, sometimes with visual changes, again, AVP deficiency and hypopituitarism. Tumor markers can be circulating or measured in the CSF, and again, the treatment is very specialist. It may involve radiotherapy and chemotherapy. 
So the endocrine aspects are your subsequent hormone replacement therapy, but also if they've needed particular types of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, then you'll be developing an individualized care plan for their late effects follow up, looking for other potential consequences of the treatment that they needed. So just to think briefly about reassessing pituitary function and transition. So just, I've really put some questions there. I'm not gonna say exactly how to do this because I think it's very individualized, but things to think about. So you need to think about when in relation to growth and puberty. Um, and typically the answer to that is at the end of that period. Really important to think that you don't want to avoid, you want to avoid inducing instability at, typical, at, at critical time points in the young person's life. So if they're just coming up for their exams, you don't want to be stopping their stable hormone therapy and reassessing them. That would clearly not be, not be sensible. You need to think about whether there are or indeed aren't indications to test. You, as with everything in endocrinology, we shouldn't just be testing for the sake of it or because we can. In terms of the where, again, there'll be individualized decision making in terms of is this patient going to be best served by having dynamic function testing in a pediatric environment or in an adult environment. And in many centers, these decisions will just be pragmatic, as in where do you have the resources to do the different tests? Obviously, there's the how, which test or which tests, and which axis or which axes. So in terms of brief thought of thoughts about this, and again, a lot of this is, is similar to we do in an adult. So adrenalax is obviously very simply, if somebody's on hydrocortisone, you can get a bit of a feel by just doing a morning cortisol. So axin tests are available and ITTs are available. The thyroid axis, again, you can, without you know, causing great distress, pause thyroxine for a couple of weeks and just reassess somebody's thyroid axis. Again, picking your time carefully, so it's not time where you're going to, uh, you know, anything that they notice from that is going to affect, for example, school performance. Gonadal axis, so typically you're going to be sort of asking the question or trying to work out if this is a, just a constitutional delay of growth and puberty, or is this a, a, you know, a hypogonadic hypogonadism that's not going to, to recover. So ways of doing that, um, so your clinical examination could be helpful, um, so doing a tanner staging, and particularly in boys, the testicular volume. So if the testes are growing, then that's, you know, that's a very good sign, essentially. In girls, um, once you've achieved an adult size uterus with your hormone treatment on an ultrasound scan, then you can just pause the HRT for a few months just to permit a clinical and biochemical reassessment. Um, so that's something that can be done. And again, in boys, once you've achieved satisfactory pubertal development, then you can pause their testosterone treatment. Sometimes it takes a bit longer to sort of unpick uh, in boys. And at that time, you may or may not wish to do a semen analysis as well to sort of really sort of assess uh, what their gonadal axis is doing. In terms of the growth of an IGF-1 axis, obviously you're waiting until someone's completed their linear growth, and then they need to be a month off growth hormone. And you'll be familiar that there is a transitional indication for growth hormone treatment until the mid twenties, which is really to achieve peak bone mass, um, peak muscle mass. So this is not a quality of life indication. You don't have to get people filling out quality of life questionnaires. It is really important to discuss with your patient before retesting them. So you will find some young people will say once they've, you know, once they've finished their growth, that the last thing they want ever is to go back onto growth hormone treatment. It's an injectable daily uh, treatment. So, you know, obviously you'll talk to them about the pros and cons, but there's no point retesting someone if they don't want the treatment any longer. Um, you don't really need to retest for growth hormone deficiency at transition if somebody already has um, three or more pituitary hormone deficiencies or a known genetic or structural um, defects of their pituitary. I've put a slight question mark there because sometimes actually people end up not being growth hormone deficient, but um, uh, you know, those, theoretically those are patients who don't need to be retested. There are obviously a wide range of tests and cutoffs used, and I'm not going to go into that in detail, it'll be a whole other talk, but I think what's important to remember as endocrinologists is none of our tests are perfect. The data in terms of, of um, thresholds for this age group is often quite uh, poor, and you really need to interpret your test in the clinical context rather than being incredibly rigid about exactly one particular specific test. Sometimes you can have a bit of a bargain with your patient if they don't want to go back on daily injections of growth hormone, will they do it just a few times a week? Um, you know, they don't have to take it on holiday with them, so you can have that sort of a discussion. So just some of the challenges. So I think, again, we all know this, but patients with hypothalamic diseases, for example, patients with craniopharyngiomas, can be really tricky, tricky for them, tricky for us. Um, the AVP deficiency, and then obviously if they've got um, loss of sense of, of, of thirst as well, very, very tricky. 
the obesity and the hyperphagia. And again, at transition, you know, parents or carers previously may have exerted quite significant control over, you know, locked cupboards and things. Um, and that's, you know, obviously going to, to be less easy. And the capacity of the patient, you know, which is a very difficult thing in terms of, of, of restricting access to food. They may also be um, have difficulties with their sleep-wake cycle. If they're very overweight, you may think about obstructive sleep apnea. Sometimes melatonin can be helpful and sometimes not. And then again, we'll all have met the patients who really have multiple comorbidities to manage. So seizures and epilepsy, visual impairment, learning disabilities, autistic spectrum disorder, possibly mental health um, problems. So it's not just the difficulties of all of those things in one patient, but when you're trying to do your tests, your blood tests, your MRIs, this could be really hard. And you do need to involve your anaesthetics team. You need to find who is the sort of friendly anaesthetist to help you with this. And also your learning disability nurse team, because sometimes they can sort of create an environment around a blood test that will support a patient with learning disabilities to actually manage to get the tests taken. Just to mention neuropsychology assessments, these can be really useful for some patients. And if you work in a sort of neurosurgical center or have access to one, these should be available to you. So what's assessed is um, things like memory, cognition, uh, general mental health, and there's quite specific assessments, sort of uh, batches of tests that go very systematically through attention, memory, visual, spatial, language, executive functions, kind of decision-making and mood. And what the patient gets is a really detailed assessment, comparing them where they are to what would be a normalised range. So you get a sort of baseline. It's useful for the patients, can be really helpful if they're trying to get employment, that they can present this as a summary. And, you know, employers do have to make um, adjustments, for example, for learning disabilities. Um, and it can also be useful if people need support, so social service support, to evidence their application. So, you know, you get a sort of summary, you get a formulation, you get a bit of a plan, and you get some recommendations. And that may be some strategies, you know, if someone has problems with their memory, ways that they can use their phone or you know, all sorts of things to try and get around that. They may be offered some therapeutic sessions for mental health issues, or maybe onward referrals if it's more a psychiatric condition that actually needs psychiatric help or somebody may need more help in terms of um, autistic spectrum disorder. So those can be really quite useful. So I'll just finish off describing just three patients briefly, just to, you know, I guess bring it back down to the, to the clinical situation. So this patient was referred um, uh, at 17 years, six months with delayed growth in puberty. So you do sometimes get these very late uh, referrals, don't you, coming through. So he'd been on the 50th centile, but then had fallen off to the second to ninth centile of growth. Had uh, two mil testes and blood fitted with hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism with an otherwise normal pituitary profile. So in terms of initial management, <clears throat> and I think it's really important when these um, boys come like this, just get them going on treatment. You know, they're really far behind socially with their peers. They're really fed up of looking so young, not having facial hair being so short. The last thing they want is for you to do lots and lots of faffing before you start treatment. And so just start the treatment. You can do all your other tests once you've got them going. So then we did a bone age, which was a couple of years delays as you expect. Um, did do an MRI scan um, and there was no structural abnormality of the hypothalamus and pituitary and did do the hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism gene panel and didn't identify a genetic cause. After a year of testosterone treatment, uh, the testes were about five mils. So just to the subsequent management of the patient. So once he'd achieved satisfactory growth and uh, pubertal development, he was quite high flyer, got a university place. And he felt that for him, a good time to pause the testosterone treatment was going to be abroad, traveling for six months. He thought that would be a good time. So we did that. He came back. We then confirmed that he did have hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism, thought about university, what was going to be a convenient sort of treatment, swapped him over to Nibido. And at that time, had a bit of a discussion about about options for future fertility. So that's just an example. You may well have come across these patients in your adult endocrine clinic as well. So this next patient was a patient who had charge association. So, um, you know, obviously not everyone has all the features, but this patient had short stature, um, learning disabilities, was hearing impaired, had had um, congenital heart disease, which had been treated from infancy, had required peg feeding and some surgery had suffered in childhood from frequent aspirations and bronchiectasis. And from the endocrine perspective, he had hypogonadism and growth hormone deficiency. So in terms of his transitional care, he got some better hearing aids, which was great. 
um, his oral intake was actually um, able to get uh, to get let to, to improve. So he needed less peg feeding, and he was actually able to manage that himself overnight. So that was a much improved compared to the situation in his childhood. And the respiratory physicians were really happy. He wasn't getting any more aspirations. He wasn't getting any more chest infections. And in fact, his lungs looked good. We swapped him over. He actually was quite small. And as sometimes happens in these patients, on libido became polycythemic. So we popped him onto test gel and that stabilized. <clears throat> we continued his growth hormone treatment until he was 25. At that point, we were actually thinking, well, really, he could be discharged to the GP from the endocrine perspective on a kind of patient-initiated follow-up sort of re-referral thing in terms of the monitoring of his testosterone treatment, his testosterone blood tests, and his, um, his blood counts. Um, at that stage, after college, he did some voluntary work. He then did some less than full-time paid work, but he was still dependent on living with his parents. So this is an example of a patient where medically, everyone was saying that things are going really well, but he was really not happy with you know, the cards life had dealt him with his, his, his situation in life. And really sadly started overeating. Um, this child had always been super skinny because he'd relied on peg feeding, um, excess alcohol and self-harm attempts. So I think we have to really remember this medically. Sometimes we'll think, well, this is, you know, this is great. This, this person with all these disabilities, look how well they're doing. But actually they, they can end up, not always, but can end up, uh, you know, just uh, not happy in themselves with mental health problems. So this is the last patient I'll just mention. So this is a, a female patient who had a chiasmatic hypothalamic uh, polycystic astrocytoma, so a bit of a mouthful. Um, so it presented when she was five and she had a subtotal resection. Recurrence age six was treated with stereotactic radiotherapy. Recurrence age 14 treated with chemotherapy and a VP shunt. So I think anyone looking at that scan will know this patient's in trouble, aren't they? It's just, you know, sort of mothership territory and it's really damaged. So this is, you know, a patient who's going to have difficulties. So at transition, um, the issues were, obviously she was panhypopit and treated for that. She had hypothalamic dysfunction, so she had hyperphagia and obesity with already a high BMI even at that age. We put her on some metformin for diabetes prevention at that stage, which is obviously a nice indication. Um, given her obesity, we switched her from oral to transdermal HRT just to optimize the, the sort of risk benefit ratio of that. Um, she had visual impairment, as obviously you'd expect, um, so blind in one eye and extremely constricted fields in the other eye. And she suffered with headaches, though the MRI scan showed stable appearances, and we sort of confirmed what should be her surveillance plan with her primary treatment center. She also suffered with fatigue and also with low mood. So, you know, you can imagine quite a conglomeration of problems. And in young adulthood, she developed further problems. So she developed some seizures with worsening headaches. And again, the MRI was stable. We did, she didn't have shunt blockage. Um, she was discussed obviously with neurology. I think it is worth mentioning, you know, in these patients with headaches, um, typically they, they aren't related to the primary tumor. And we know that with our pituitary patients, you know, they are the typical either tension or migraines or medication overuse. So, you know, GPs can manage the headaches if you sort of steer them away of thinking that they're related to the primary tumor. She gained more weight, um, so gained more weight and, and I guess inevitably developed uh, uh, type 2 diabetes and was referred to a bariatric uh, service. So, you know, difficult patients and there's no sort of straightforward solution to their, to their care. So hopefully I've given you a bit of an overview of the uh, transitional endocrine service and some of the particular problems of teens and young adults. Um, illustrated with examples, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Anna. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, as a neurosurgeon with radical experience in this particular matter, I can only imagine how much of a complicated and knotty problem it is, and you present it beautifully clearly. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Well, the audience is warming up. There's a couple of them. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here, and there's a very good question really from somebody about logistics. How many clinicians are in the room with you, and how much time do you allocate for patients? No, that is a good question. So we have um, uh, three of us in the room. So we've got an adult endocrinologist, a paediatric endocrinologist, and an endocrine, endocrine nurse specialist, the adult endocrine nurse specialist. 
Um, I have to admit it's a clinic that's popular with trainees, so we will often have a trainee as well with the patient's uh, permission. Um, these children are quite used to having multidisciplinary teams looking at them, I have to say, so they're generally not phased, but obviously as with any um, appointment, before somebody comes into the room, we say that there are quite a few of us in the room, I'll introduce you and tell you who everyone's roles are. And obviously if they're not comfortable, for example, with having, you know, um, a training, we may ask them to leave, but it is a good training clinic, but, but yes, it is a sort of team clinic and it can be a little bit daunting. Um, because then you've also got to have space, obviously, for the patient and anyone they've brought with them. And time per patient? Time per patient, we have 30 minutes, which is as much as one can do in the NHS, I think. I mean, obviously, if you had the luxury of longer, but 30 minutes is what we have. There's one more, yes, uh, about growth hormone dosing. So is it acceptable to, is there a transition dose of growth hormone or just switch that up when, if they need it? Yeah, so you, if you do, if you find that they are growth hormone deficient, you switch back to an adult dose, which obviously will be much less than the dose they were taking when they were being treated for, for growth, as it were, and then just titrate to the IGF-1 in the usual way. Um, so you can just do then monthly IGF-1s and, and titrate the dose. So you do go fairly dramatically from their paediatric dose down to sort of adult dose, but then fairly rapid up titration, so you get them on the appropriate dose for them to the IGF-1, and then just continue pretty much to 25, and then... Subsequent to that, obviously, it's more thinking about quality of life as to whether you continue or not. But often, I think, well, my personal experience is that children who've been growth hormone deficiency from childhood often don't really have the quality of life problems when they stop it afterwards. It seems to be maybe more that adults who suddenly become growth hormone deficient develop the quality of life issues. So, so, so many people can just stop after twenty five. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. So, shall we move on to the next presentation? We have Dr. Anna Thompson, who's going to talk to us about the interesting family case and diagnostic conundrum in the uh, context of patient elevated biomarkers. Good morning, and my name is Anna Thompson. I'm an endocrinology trainee at the South London DNA, currently based at King's College Hospital, and I'm excited to share a new case of a patient who presented with elevated T3 T4 in a normal TSH, which posed a diagnostic conundrum. So this case starts in 2008, when the gentleman was 38 years old. He was referred to the regional thyroid clinic with a 10-year history of persistently elevated T3 and T4 in a normal TSH. He was clinically asymptomatic at the time and had no past medical history. There was no family history of resistance to thyroid hormone syndrome, and the pituitary imaging was reported to be normal at the time. He had a non elevated alpha cell unit, and he underwent a TRH stimulation test. And his TSH rose from 1.36 millionits per litre to 14.1 millionits per litre at the 60 minute mark, demonstrating an exaggerated response. And therefore, although the genetic tests failed to identify a mutation in the thyroid hormone receptor beta gene, the patient was diagnosed with thyroid hormone resistance syndrome and discharged to primary care. The patient, however, was re referred into adult authority, this time as a 49 year old. He was referred from primary care with clinical features of diatoxicosis, including weight loss, anxiety, and palpitations over the preceding four months. He had been commenced on 30 milligrams of carbamazole once daily a biology group prior to being seen in clinic. And on review in clinic, he appeared to be clinically thyroid with no fluidic present. He had some blood tests in clinic, and the initial clinic results revealed an elevated TSH of 7.1 million per litre, with a normal free T4 of 17.9 picomoles per litre. His carbon was always there, was stopped, and his bloods were repeated. And this time around, his TSH was elevated, still at 5.21 mm per litre, but his free T4 was at high at 27.3 picomoles per litre, and his free T4 was elevated at 8.5 picomoles per litre. He had some further investigations in the form of an MRI of his pituitary. The MRI revealed a normal-sized pituitary plant with a possible sub-centimetre left-sided pituitary lesion. As you can see here, it was very subtle changes. And I'd just like to go and compare some clinical features of thyroid hormone resistance in progress versus TSH anyway. And this is based on his presentation in 2008, his original presentation. 
At that time, he had no features of clinical paradoxicosis, but he also had no features of family history. His SHPG was unhelpful throughout the time, uh, throughout his whole presentation, as it's been up and down and not consistent with a significant pattern. His TSH response to TRH simulation test, however, was very significant in keeping with resistance thyroid hormone syndrome. His genetic testing, however, was negative, and his alpha subunit was never elevated. And on the original presentation in 2008, there were no MRI features of a pituitary lesion. You can see, however, in 2020, when he represented, the clinical picture has shifted slightly. He now has presented with features of thyrotoxic cases, and the MRI suggested there was a pituitary lesion. Therefore, based on those changes in the clinical features, the diagnosis was revisited, and the patient was commenced on a trial of somatostatin analogue for a possible TSHOMA. And as you can see, the patient had responded to the trial somatostatin analog. On the first trial, the patient's thyroid function tests had improved, but the free T4 remained, uh, free T3 rather, remained elevated. Unfortunately, the first trial of somatostatin analog was truncated due to the fact that the patient was referred back to the local hospital to continue the landing time, which they were unable to do. Therefore, he was re-referred back to our um, King's College Hospital and was recommenced on the landing type. And this time around, there was complete resolution of the thyroid function tests. And also importantly, there was complete symptomatic resolution. The patient was therefore referred over to the molecular imaging team at Cambridge University, and he underwent a methionine PET imaging. And what they did at Cambridge was do his um, methionine PET imaging off and on this somatostatin analog. So as you can see in column number two, the patient was taken off the somatostatin analog and looking at his thyroid function tests as free T4 and T3 are elevated. And there is skew of uptake um, of the tracer towards the left paramedial aspect of the, the pituitary gland. The patient was then restarted on the lambutide and his thyroid function tests have normalized. And that uptake has disappeared, therefore suggesting that there's a pituitary lesion on the left side of his pituitary gland, suggesting of a tissue trauma. The patient was discussed in the pituitary MDT and was offered a transphenoidal resection of a presumed pituitary lesion, which he did undergo. In the operation notes comment that there was a normal pituitary gland in the midpoint and to the right. The left sided tissue was taken in the area that was presumed to be an adenoma. The patient had an uncomplicated post operative recovery period. His histology was reviewed in clinic uh, in the MDT. On immunohistochemistry staining, the patient was strongly PIP1 positive. And as you may be aware, the TSH arises from the pit one lineage. He also had TSH immunostaining, which the patient was strongly positive for, in keeping again with the TSH over. Postoperatively, the lamiotide was stopped following the surgery, and his thyroid function tests have remained normal throughout. He underwent an insulin stress test, which demonstrated normal growth hormone and cortisol reserve. To clinch the diagnosis further, the patient underwent a T3 suppression test after the operation. He was given 10 days of live thyroidine, 20 micrograms three times a day. And as you can see, the TSH suppressors were from 1.7 milliunits per litre to 0.02 milliunits per litre, demonstrating the resolution of the TSH that following the transfer of resection. This case demonstrates a patient who originally was misdiagnosed with thyroid hormone resistance, but subsequently was found to have a TSHM over 14 years later. And so I just wanted to take us back to this table here that distinguishes between a TSHM and assisted thyroid hormone. And there's a few tests that the patient was originally diagnosed sort of based on these features. The TSH response to TRH was very suggestive of resistance thyroid hormone syndrome. However, based on the 2013 European Thyroid Association guidelines for diagnosis and treatment of thyroid secreting pituitary tumors, 90% um, of patients with TSH owners have a blunted response to the TRH stimulation test. And so this patient clearly fell in 10%. The patient had no genetic um, mutations identified, but was regardless diagnosed with resistance to thyroid hormone syndrome. That said, the mutations in thyroid hormone receptor leachy genes are only identified in 75 to 80% of cases. He also had a non elevated alpha subunit, even though he had a pituitary lesion. Alpha subunits are only present in 70% of cases with TSH owners. And so, as you can see, it's quite difficult to gain a good picture despite using all these clinical uh, distinguishing factors. And so, with those thoughts in mind, I would like to ask the audience a few questions. 
what should the investigation strategy be to distinguish a fire from resistant syndrome versus resistant trauma? And should we have done any other further tests in the whilst we were um, investigating the patient? And should we be considering using somatostatin analog trials in equivocal cases to distinguish between the two further? Thank you very much, um, Anna. That was a really fascinating case um, and really clearly presented. Um, do we have any questions either on Zoom or from the audience? Should we start with Zoom while the audience? Uh, it's just a quick one for you, and that was what was the alpha subunit at repeat presentation? It was uh, uh, non elevated. <coughs> Question from the audience. There was a, a similar answer to the question. <laughs> um, any other questions um, from Zoom, from the audience? Yep, question at the back. And the point one is. Oh, go on, who got one? What was his SHBG? So what was the SHBG? The SHBG was um, up and down throughout his whole presentation. It was never very helpful in distinguishing the picture, and it wasn't. Particularly when he was symptomatic or asymptomatic. Question? Question? Uh, do you know how long you have to be off the somatostatin analog for the endocrine uh, test? Just repeat the question into the microphone. How long? Uh, how how long did you have to be off the somatostatin analog uh, before the time pet? Was the question. I've just double checked three months. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, great case. I mean, I think just a couple of Things. I think if you, as you know yourself, if you scan patients with uh, thyroid hormone resistance syndrome, you'll often find that they might come in as well in lots of patients, so we'll ask to be careful, but obviously the function of the is really helpful. I did just wonder if the answer could be both, um, you know, could you have an element of thyroid hormone resistance and then subsequently over the years have developed some autonomous function of the TS syndrome? I don't know, it's pure guesswork. But... Anyone else? Uh, did you do a TRI stimulation test? Uh, he had one at yeah. the original time yeah. uh, in 2008. We need to repeat it. Yeah, yeah, question of my colleagues coming up to you. I'm just conscious this is Benny's case, so I wanted to get to him for that slide. <laughs> well, I, I'm involved in the case, so, uh, but uh, I guess I wondered, Anna, if I could ask you about. The role of the T3 suppression test because the narrative you told was that this patient didn't have a T3 suppression test and then they did right at the end. Can you say any more about the value of that test? So the T3 suppression test was only done after the operation to prove that there was a resolution of the TSA trauma, um, but it could have possibly been done earlier on to try to distinguish between the two. Um, so in theory, if the patient had a TSA trauma for that oral presentation, his T3 would not have would not have suppressed um, and with high enough doses and um, if it's resistant to thyroid hormone syndrome it would have been suppressed, uh, suppressed so potentially that would have been another useful in, um, sort of method of distinguishing between the two. Yeah, this is just one I'm just coming through sorry turn to the back to the question. All right Liv, but I was listening on the zoom so uh I have a similar patient, so what I want to clarify whether the patient had any kind of clinical features of uh, you know, hypothyroidism. Will that help us differentiate whether it's a resistance or a case of trauma? So, back in 2008, when he presented originally and was diagnosed with thyroid hormone resistance syndrome, he had no clinical features. But when he was re referred in 2020, the patient presented with clinical features of thyroid toxicosis, and that's, I think, what changed the diagnostic picture. There's one question here that says, does this study not show the importance of PET CT? Was that from Cambridge? <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it was very nice to show it switched on and switched off, I thought, actually. That's lovely. And what it was useful to do was to identify that it was on the left side so that the neurosurgeons were able to well, more confidently go in and assume that the lesion was on the left side and remove that part of the pituitary whilst leaving the left alone. And therefore, he's still the pituitary at the moment. And that, that was a very useful feature of this kind of way. Thank you. Thank you. There is a hand raised. I don't think it sounds going to work. Shall we just. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I think it doesn't work. Actually. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much for that fascinating case. Um, I think we can move on.
on our next presentation from Dr. Minster from Bargain, Hickering and Redbridge Hospital. Um, he is going to deliver a talk um, on the triphasic response following pituitary surgery, a case report for the rare water balance disorder. Just hold it, I think it help people here. I'll get comments in sometimes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. All right, good morning everyone. Very nice to meet you all. Uh, my name is me. So today I would like to present a rare case of uh, water salt balance disorder, a triphasic response for pituitary surgery. Um, this is very relevant for the post-operative uh, management of pituitary tumor, uh, at least from a neuroendocrine perspective. So I'll start with a very brief introduction and then we'll come to the case. Um, so we know that pituitary tumors are very common and most of them present incidentally. However, if they do present with symptoms, they usually present with mass effects, symptoms such as headache, vision loss, uh, cranial nerve dysfunction, uh, and or pituitary hormone hypo or hyperfunction. Uh, it's important to know that not all pituitary tumors need surgery. However, if surgeries <coughs> sorry, are indicated uh, is usually done by an MDT approach. Um, Transphenoidal surgery, or TSS, was traditionally performed by a microscopic approach. However, in the recent years, an endoscopic approach is more preferred. Um, Preoperatively, all the patients need to be assessed, uh, so we can assess the function of the pituitary tumor, and we also have to evaluate the pituitary hormones and treat any underlying pituitary conditions. Um, all those patients need uh, immediate um, perioperative management. So, after surgery, patients generally stay in the hospital for between one to three nights. Um, sodium and water imbalances are relatively common. Um, they happen early on um, in the post-operative post period, usually within the first 24 to 48 hours. Uh, AVP deficiency, or previously known as central DI, uh, is more likely to happen than SIADH. Um, they can both occur in isolation. They can also occur, uh, occur as part of the biphasic or triphasic response. Uh, but regardless, both of the conditions are associated with uh, increased mobility, a prolonged hospital stay, and an increased risk of uh, readmission. So I just want to quickly talk about the mechanism of the triphasic response. Um, so triphasic response was first reported in 1985. So immediately after surgery, um, there's a disruption um, uh, due to the partial or complete uh, section of the pituitary stock. There's a disruption between the AVP neuronal bodies in the hypothalamus and the nerve terminals in the posterior pituitary. Um, this axonal shock can essentially prevent the simulated AVP uh, secretion. So this contributes to the first phase of uh, AVP deficiency. Then ISA-ADH can occur. This is due to the uncontrolled release of the large amount of AVP from the posterior pituitary due to the degeneration of the nerve terminals. Um, the duration of this period is highly variable. It can happen between four days to 14 days. And then afterwards, um, if there is a complete section of pituitary stock, or if there is more than 80% of the ADP neural body have undergone retrograde degeneration, um, this situation of <coughs> ADPD uh, deficiency can reoccur because of no release of ADP. So uh, it's very important to recognize and treat these conditions uh, early on. So this study um, proposed a diagnostic uh, algorithm uh, to diagnose the uh, AVPD uh, post-operative So patients generally present with polyuria, polydipsia, they may have symptoms of hypernatremia, and their biochemistry chemistry can show a high uh, plasma sodium, a high raised osmolality, and a diluted urine with reduced urine osmolality and reduced urine specific gravity. So treatment is essentially uh, treat as needed, so patient can get a set dose of desmopressin. So you want to avoid regular dosing because uh, if you give repeated dosing, if the true SIADH occurs later on, uh, you might have a, uh, it might be hidden essentially, so you might have a great drop of sodium level, which you don't see. Uh, obviously, you also want to monitor closely of the fluid input and output, and also to monitor the resolution of the transient AVPD. Uh, and uh, or any further triphasic response. So diagnosis of ISIADH, um, so they typically have a low serum osmolality, 
the higher urine osmolality. Um, this patient can be clinically urolimic because they tend to retain free fluids and this gives a picture of uh, dimensional hypometremia. Uh, treatment essentially is fluid restriction, um, plus minus hypertonic saline. Uh, if none of the methods work, you can consider if a uh, ADP receptor antagonist such as uh, Tawadaptan. So now we come to the case. So we have a 54-year-old female. She's got five months history of uh, visual deterioration. Uh, she has a past medical history of acid reflux and hypothyroidism. Uh, she's on omeprazole and levothyroxine. So on examination, she has bitemporal hemianopia, and a later on MRI scan showed a 3.6 centimeter cystic pituitary adenoma. And the biochemistry shows a normal HPA axis and is confirmed a non-functioning pituitary adenoma. Uh, she underwent microscopic uh, uh, TSS surgery and the surgery was unimitable. So this is just a very quick table showing the preoperative uh, labs. Uh, essentially, uh, she's got high, low T4, uh, borderline high prolactin level, which could be due to the compression of the pituitary stock or could be due to the hypothyroidism. But essentially, this is a non-functioning pituitary adenoma. So these are the MRI images. So the two on the left are showing the large cystic lesion, and the one on the left are post-operative uh, picture showing the antisal with no fluid correction. So, uh, post of day one, her sodium level was a little bit high, and the serum osmolality is also borderline high, and she has a low urine osmolality. Uh, she was okay at the time. Uh, post of day two and day three, she started to become um, to develop polyuria and polyphysia. So she was given a stat dose of desmopressin, and her symptoms improved, and urine output decreased, and she was discharged on post of day four uh, with a slightly increased dose of levothyroxine, but without no. Uh, new hormonal medication. So oops. she went home. So at Queen's Hospital, we monitor patients uh, hospital surgery very closely. So post up day eight, she attended hospital operation department for a repeat blood test and urine test. So this time, as, it, as you can see, she developed a hyponatremia, uh, low serum osmolality and a very high urine osmolality. Uh, at this point of time, she was completely symptom free but she was admitted for monitoring. And the day later, she developed a severe headache and dizziness. She was in fact uh, admitted to ITU for close monitoring. So this is just a table uh, illustrating the key timeline. So just to recap, post-op post she developed polyurea polydipsia, uh, classic picture of ADP deficiency, and she was given uh, desmopressin and sent home. And then later she came back with uh, SIADH. Uh, we started her on uh, fluid restriction and then later on hypertonic saline. So she stayed in this period for a couple, uh, for about five days. And then she developed polyurea polydipsia again. So she developed a recurrent uh, ADP deficiency and she was started on desmopressin BD now. So uh, later on, there was a trial of holding the decimal pressing, however, that failed, so she became polyuric polydipsia again. Uh, so we put her back on decimal pressing and monitored her for a couple of days, and she was discharged with the decimal pressing. Uh, so she had a repeat blood test six weeks postoperatively at her local hospital. We don't have the results here, but uh, we do have the results uh, three months later. Uh, we reviewed her in the clinic. Uh, this time she has high T4, we probably over treating the hypothyroidism. She's also got a higher uh, borderline high prolactin level, but the rest, rest of the blood were satisfactory. So we also performed a water deprivation test at this stage. So she omitted the uh, evening dose the night before and the morning dose of decimal pressing. And as, I, as you can see in the, in the table, uh, she's got a uh, raised serum osmolality and a hypotonic urine, so suggesting she's now got a chronic or permanent ADP deficiency, so she needs to be on desmopressin lifelong. So I had a look of the literature, so there are a couple of predictor, uh, predictors for increased risk of uh, postoperative ADP deficiency, including in, uh, intraoperative CSF leak, microadenoma, cranial uh, pharyngenoma, recus cleft cyst. And there are also two studies uh, independently showing that prolonged duration of the surgery and the transaction of the pituitary stock can also increase the risk. Um, 
So just in summary, uh, this is a case of a 54-year-old female. She's got a non-functioning pituitary adenoma, underwent surgery, and then developed a classic triphasic response of uh, AVP deficiency, as an ADH and a recurrent or permanent AVP deficiency again. So it's very important um, that we can recognize and manage these disorders early on uh, following the pituitary surgery. Um, there are challenges in terms of uh, predicting the development of the AVPD and SIADH, despite their multiple uh, risk factors available. Um, it's also important to uh, identify the appropriate time frame of managing these kind of patients. Currently, there's no guideline, and this may be made on a case by case basis. And the last but not least, the important role of the MDT approach uh, in terms of for timely intervention and effective management. So just a couple of questions for the audience. Um, I just wonder any of you have managed these kind of patients um, with trapezoid response in your setting and how do you manage them? And the follow-on question is how do we uh, monitor them uh, after discharge? Because we're quite lucky at Queen's, we managed to capture this rare phenomenon, but how often should we monitor the, uh, the, the biochemistry in terms of the, in, to be able to capture the fluctuating sodium level? So just some questions to the audience. Thank you. Okay, there's a question here about whether the use of copeptin might be helpful in these patients. Several copeptin, co use of copeptin, which is uh, another marker of uh, of ADH. Yeah. I am, based on my limited experience, okay. I've not used that marker myself. Um, okay. I haven't seen that in the literature. Well, I suppose. Um, really, the role of copeptin, as we see it currently, is to differentiate between the to identify accurately the partial yeah. ABP deficiency which I guess wasn't really, in terms of, you had a water deprivation test. You can bring that up. Please go back to that. We can have a chat about that for a minute. Go back, yeah. There. So even at time zero, the plasma osmolality, serum osmolality, well, it's quite high, it's really high. It's quite high, it's high. And since we put her back on, just impressing the urine osmolality is so much. So we have this picture that consistently is a chronic or more permanent picture of the AVP deficiency. It's the sodium. Do you know what the sodiums are in the patient? It's not on there, but... Yeah, I unfortunately don't have it on my um, uh, slides. Okay. So I suppose that, so I think copeptin would be more if there was an ambiguity about the water deprivation test. Mm -hmm. But I guess looking at that, they never really protect their Similar to those, but three and eleven by yeah. two o'clock. So I, we often look at the sodium too, but it, it looks like I'd be quite happy with that. Yeah. I think. Could have. Um, and a glucose. You've got a glucose. Uh, I don't have glucose. Well, that's a very good question. Actually, because yeah, I always check on the glucose. Different mm -hmm. diabetes hats on too. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Another question to back. Yes. Let me run up. Did you classify as partial or complete? So you mean the section of the sock? No, no, the uh, water deprivation test. Partial, basic pressure, and insufficient Um, I thought it was the complete uh, baby experience. That's why she used to be on. Um, that's more present. Back Just one question. So after surgery, um, what was the cold disorder? Was the patient ever given steroids during the IT admission? And then you managed to have them very good question. So you mean pre-operative or pericardial post-operative? Um, I can't really recall whether we did steroids, but I know um, we treated with uh, again. So I don't think we give her steroids. So the initial period, uh, we just gave her a dose of uh, desmopressin and she was clinically improved, so we sent her home. So I don't remember we gave anything um, steroids. And also her HPA axis was normal, so there was not uh, any struggles of hydrocortisol being given, either preoperative or paralytic. Um, <coughs> so, no. Thank you, that's is interesting case. Um, you asked about how this is managed in some other places. I was just going to just make some comments. I mean, 
we, at King's, we might have kept the patient in a bit longer because when they've had an episode of PI, we sometimes watch them a bit, anticipating other problems. Um, I agree with you that checking the sodium at day eight to 10 post-op is really good practice. We really struggle to do that because the patients just go off to Canterbury and then we yeah. ask them for sodium, <laughs> or ask them if they'd like to pop back and then they, they respectfully decline, uh, maybe they feel well. So we, it's not something we've really cracked the whole kind of, you should check the sodium maybe seven to 10 days post-op. But uh, so I, I, I'm impressed you got that day eight sodium and you might have failed there. I suppose the only other thing I was noticing, you, you, you use really very low doses of desmopressin compared to us. I was just a bit struck. Do you find that 50 micrograms of desmopressin in OD or BG works? Um, do you ever use more? Do you ever use sucker? I feel like I, so she, she just had one single dose uh, initially in the first place, and that worked for her. So I have seen a guy that not guy that initially just as you use uh, IV or sucker. So it really depends on your experience, I suppose. So I'll just say very quickly that um, I was interested that uh, you readmitted her uh, when she had her sodium 120 and was asymptomatic. And I'm looking at our surgeons in the room because, of course, there's a push pull, isn't there, all the time about the pressure for discharge and needing a bed, and we're all we're all in that in, in that conversation. I mean, I suppose it's interesting that because you've done really well and picked her up with her sodium 120, which is actually five, wasn't she? And it's whether you have the confidence that she's going to report into you and you could just do some outpatient sodium versus then finding a bed for this person and all the you know all the difficulties around that. I don't know if had any thoughts, but it's difficult to know, isn't it, when you bring them through casualty, would you trust her to report to you and have some daily sodium? So I guess that's an alternative depending on how engaged the patient is really. Yeah. I feel that most of the challenge is actually capturing the phenomenon rather than yeah, well, it's very rare, so you did very well, actually. Um, okay, thank you so much. Oh. Oh. Let's try and see if we can hear that. Okay. Gideon, do you want me to try and ask a question? No, I just want to I just want to make a comment, and um, in terms of somebody has asked a question of whether we use COPEP, COPEP, um, we use another asset to, to look for uh, whether there's ADH deficiency. We don't have that facilities in our hospital. But what we did with this patient was just to closely monitor the patient. And it was under, during, it was a February, it was very busy in the hospital. There was a patient discharging patients, but what we did was make sure that we monitor the patient. We were able to capture that the patient was going into the triphasic phase response in terms of uh, going from hyponatremia to hyponatremia. That was very quiet, I'm afraid. I don't know. I hope it's no, just that. We don't, don't hear worry. that. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. That's another good presentation. It's very clear. Um, we'd like to move on, please. We've got uh, Dr. Samara Singh, who's going to kind of present about the case of another surgical case. Excuse me. Uh, uh, <laughs> on the topic of microclimate. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Sahani. I'm one of the endocrinology registrars at Charing Cross, and I'm presenting an interesting case of MRI occult mycoplactinoma cured by surgical resection. So this was a 31-year-old female who initially presented in 2021 with a three-year history of amenorrhea. She also had symptoms of lower libido, dyspareunia, fatigue, lethargy, and a nine and a half kilo weight loss. To note, there was no history of galacteria, no headaches or visual disturbance, and she was not actively seeking pregnancy when she was seen in clinic. She had previously been on a progesterone-only pill from June 2020 till May 2021. When she came to clinic, she was only taking vitamin D, 1,000 units once a day. Uh, she was a non-smoker and drank alcohol rarely. So in keeping with the NICE guidelines and investigating secondary amenorrhea, she had routine blood tests, including pituitary function tests. So I've just included the important results on here. So she had normal thyroid function tests, uh, a normal 9am cortisol, low LH and FSH with a low estradiol, and a raised prolactin with a monomeric of 672. We then went on to do a cannulated prolactin, and it showed it was a true hyperprolactinemia. So a baseline was 1,119 and a two-hour value of 1,263. 
When she came, she was also a companion of quite significant pelvic discomfort. She had an ultrasound of a renal tract and pelvis, which is normal. And given that she had hypogonadotropic hypogonadism on blood, she also had a DEXA scan that was normal, uh, normal bone mineral density. During subsequent visits, she complained of ongoing pelvic pain, and it showed she had an ultrasound of her pelvis, which showed a small increase in endometrial thickness with a moderate increase in the right ovarian follicular function when compared to the initial ultrasound scan. She was also complaining of some object, subjective polyuria and polydipsia, so she went on to have a water deprivation test, which is reassuringly normal. Given her blood test, she had a routine MRI pituitary. So she had quite a few MRI pituitary scans um, while she was seen by our Austin clinic. Um, so this was a scan from the 10th of June, 2022. There's four different images. So image A is a pre-contrast T1-weighted coronal image. T2, uh, B is T2-weighted coronal. C is a post-contrast T1-weighted coronal. And D was a post-contrast T1-weighted MRI imaging of the cellar. So there's an arrow in both images B and C to point to a very, very subtle area of signal change on the left side with reduced enhancement. But there was no definitive focal lesion and the pituitary stalk was in the midline. And all of her MRI scans always reported showing no obvious pituitary lesion. So her initial management in keeping with the Endocrine Society guidelines for treating uh, hypophylactinemia was initiation with cabergoline, 250 micrograms weekly. That was for two months. She didn't tolerate this, and this was due to quite significant dizziness. She was in change to bromocryptine, 1.25 milligrams once a day. Again, she didn't tolerate this, and this was quite, as a result of quite significant nausea, and that was three weeks. She remained quite intolerant of medical management um, and had ongoing amenorrhea with low progesterone. She was started on the combined oral contraceptive pill, but again, this was not tolerated. I'm just going to skip ahead and I'll come back to it. So this is a graph of her prolactin levels. She was having them done quite regularly as an outpatient. Um, as you can see, she started cabergoline in August of 2021. And then her prolactin levels responded very nicely to the treatment. It actually normalized. But unfortunately, she then came off it and the levels rose again. Because she was on bromocryptine for such a short period of time, there wasn't any significant change to the prolactin levels. And they remained elevated throughout. So given that her symptoms were ongoing and she was intolerant of medical management, she was referred for surgical consideration. She was seen in the neurosurgical clinic and the plan was to do an outpatient methionine PET scan. And these are the methionine PET images. So as you can see, there's increased trace uptake on the left side near the left cavernous sinus. And it was reported as uh, a probable lesion that was hugging the left cavernous sinus. The images were discussed together with the MRI pituitary images at our local pituitary MDT and was thought to be in keeping with a micro prolactinoma on the left side. She then went on to have endoscopic endonasal transnodal surgery for pituitary tumor in July of this year. There were no intraoperative or postoperative complications and she did not require steroids on discharge. Um, as is usual protocol, she also had histology sent during the surgery. I'll just run through it very quickly. So because it was a microadenoma, most of the tissue was normal pituitary tissue, which you can see here. There was areas of pituitary adenoma, which are in the red circles here. So it was strange that it was PIT1 lineage. So PIT1 lineage means that it abstains for prolactinomas, growth hormone secreting adenomas or acromegaly or TSHoma, but her stain for prolactin, so it was a prolactinoma. And they also always report the KI67 index, which is a marker of proliferation, and it was less than three, which means it was a low KI67 index. Postoperatively, and almost immediately, her prolactin levels recovered. So prolactin went from uh, over 1,000 to 205, and then it st stayed normal since then. These were repeat blood tests that were done in outpatient clinic in July of this year. The thyroid function tests are normal. The estradiols picked up. Um, LH and FLH are still technically low, given that she has a low estradiol as well. Prolactin is normal, SHBG is normal. So she feels well, however, she has ongoing amenorrhea. Um, but given that she's just had surgery, we hope this will recover fairly soon. Let's do another MRI pituitary in October. Just a couple of questions for the audience. The first one is, should we be considering surgery as first line treatment for patients with a macroprolactinoma? And two, in patients with a prolactinoma but no clearly defined surgical target, 
should we be routinely exploring other imaging modalities, example, methionine PET to gain further information about the option of surgery? That was a really interesting case and good at conversation. Um, questions either on Zoom or from the audience? Yeah, there's, there's a Zoom question here about cutoffs. Uh, there's a question about setting cutoffs at 1,500 because the huge number of pills we get with slightly borderline prolactins. And then how about a cutoff of 3,000 if they're on any drugs that might cause it? Is that will miss this case. Oh, oh I'm sorry. I've yeah. stolen this. I'm yeah. so sorry. So this is a really good question here. Cut off the prolactin. 1,500 is a suggestion because of the large number of patients who are referred with a borderline raised prolactin. And that was missed this case, presumably. Yeah, yeah we've missed this. So that's a bit of a challenge. But uh, we do get a lot of referrals is the point that's being made here. This is presumably advice and guidance or the equivalent, isn't it? There is a deluge of query high prolactins on there for whoever's the audience that's here or Yeah, and, and many use 1,000, but many use 1,500 in the patient with the disturbance. Well, that's why you use the cannulated prolactin, wasn't it? Find shades of it generally. That's why I use the cannulated prolactin. That's a big question. And actually, with that, um, Alana is going to be here this afternoon, so talking about the outpatients, pituitary management, a bit of advice and guidance. So we could actually bring that back in this afternoon for as well with mm -hmm. because it doesn't pop up in her talk thinking about how we manage. I find I find most practical on advice and guidance really difficult. I don't know if anyone sympathizes, but I find it's impossible to work out from the everyone's got a regular period, it seems to me. And I can't quite work out if the regular period plus a bit of you know perhaps a sort of punch and I suppose we say yes or no, I end up saying yes to almost all of those because I can't seem to unpick it with a little bit of information I've got, but I might be unusual. I don't unpick it then now and I'm looking wondering about your advice and guidance on that scarf because it, it, it is, I'm sorry to, to drop you And then while you're on the way, there's yes. some things about using other drugs like quinagolide before surgery. Can you talk about that? Let's start spin. <laughs> well, but, well, we might just come back to this advice and guidance because I know it's really important for trainees often because Advice and guidance is one of those things that you're expected to step into as a consultant, but you don't often have very much exposure to it as a registrar. No, I mean, I, I agree with you, Nick, it's they are hard cases. Um, uh, I, I just ask that you could repeat it at least, you know, as long as they say I've done one, I'm a bit worried. Um, and you, you want to get a few because the genius can't be candidate for that, but they can get more than one sample to try and make sure it at least appears to be a consistent thing. and then. I accept the referral, but sometimes I try and send them straight for cannulated productives pre before, prior to seeing them. So we go, what do we call it? Straight to test. Uh, so I go, uh, cannulated productives in our investigation unit, if they're normal, we will drop the case. Um, so that's one way to be parsimonious. Um, isn't the concern that if we were to raise the cutoff, if we had a patient who was seeking fertility? And they had an elevated prolactin, but it was below 3,000 and they sorry. needed IVF. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I said, wouldn't the. Oh, just press the button. Um, I guess my question is if you had a young female patient who had a raised prolactin, but it was below. Oh, I just said, we've got here. Can you hold the mic? Sorry, yeah. the mic's yeah. not yeah. working. Just, just press that. Just press that one. Yeah. And then let go. It's very weak. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just saying if you had a young patient who was seeking fertility, um, and they came in with the prolactin was less than, if the cutoff was higher and it was less than 3,000 and we didn't see them, would that not affect that if they were going for IVF or they were needing assistive fertility? So that would. And a lot of our patients are coming in because, I mean, we were discussing at the Pituitary MT, there's a lot of prolactins less than 3,000 that we would just miss, and those patients would just be, I guess, left in primary care. I was just going to point out that the PP in your patient, she had three years of age and three years, that's very significant age in Maria. A lot of my advice and guidance, I keep saying, is when I keep saying, I should like to be having her regular period. <laughs> 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 quite, quite, um, Corinne, should we come back to that quinagolide question? So, so Hanley, I was just going to be cheeky because I've got the microphone and ask the question about this by hand up, which is you said that she was intolerant of cobertin, and I wanted to know. What, why was she intolerant? What side effects did she have? Dizziness. Dizziness, okay. So and not nausea with, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And nausea with a bar of And what I'm going to 
Thank you, it's a nice case. I think just with your specific question on the screen, my, my answer to the first person would be absolutely no, we've got a lovely, lovely medical treatment, which is quite a recipe, the second line. <laughs> and the second question, I think we've seen a couple of examples where these scans have been brilliant, but um, you know, as a, a centre of fair to Cambridge, that can introduce a very significant delay in someone's pathway. I think you know, they can be very, very helpful in um, uh, in tricky cases, particularly in obviously health surgeon and direct surgeon. But at the present time, the lack of availability of their scan, I think that must be, has to be taken into account. Thank you, Anna. I'm coming up to Ben, and I suppose as I'm I'm going to do really multitask and talk and walk. I suppose just in reference to China's point, there are a lot of large surgical series, aren't there, coming out of North America about the pros and cons of first line pituitary surgery platinoma, and they've got quite different drivers. They're often from, sorry to the surgeons, but they're often from neurosurgical centres. And also, don't forget, in America, there's obviously the insurance issue around long term medication. But coming back to quinagolized, well, which I'm going to need to just get to two, two seconds. It's obviously not, there's very little head to head data, it's not as effective in Roman collecting as the Berlin. And in some um, European guidelines, which I cannot find any evidence for this statement, apart from some rat study from a really long time ago, but there is a specific statement around the safety of quinagolide in someone who wants to conceive. So it's not supposed to be the dopamine agonist of choice. However, uh, there's very little evidence I can find for literature to support that. Just thinking about the patient I've had to manage recently. I'm going to Ben now, sorry. Um, hi, yeah, I was uh, really about the, the surgical approach to this and how you kind of consent this patient. I, I know you wouldn't personally be consenting to the operation, but the point is you want a very good result because part of the pituitary is removed. You remove the cells producing excess prolactin, normal pituitary function resulted, great outcome. But if the patient is saying, well, will I end up post, will I end up hypopituitary post-op, or if the tumour is more in the middle, uh, it would potentially change your management. And I wonder, for example, if the patient said, how likely am I to be hypo after this operation, what would you say, what would people say about that risk? Have the surgeon next to you, so we can ask him what he said. Thanks. Well, it's based on your own results. <laughs> 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 well, I like to speak to me uh, about this over the years that you know, when you consent patients to results of surgery, it's no good to talk about the results of the literature when you really need to present your own surgical series. Now, I, I do think mm. for relaxing the surgery should be off patients. I think it's a good operation, so it's a safe operation. And I would say, our uh, Remission rate got in excess of 80%. And I know our risk generally of making some hypopituitary pituitary abnormal, all groups up with giants, and it was well less than 20% if they've got normal function before. And I think for you know, an abnormal uh, centimeter or less, typical for uh, a microcrack, maybe you'd be pretty confident that you'd say pituitary function. Now, of course, that comes down to the skill and expertise of surgeons, and that's important for the work in the team. But ultimately, I think surgery should be offered as a treatment because it is an option. And uh, you've got to do a fair reflection on the outcomes to the patient so they can make an informed decision. And there are risks with medical treatment as well, as we know. Can I cheekily uh, ask a quick question? I suppose you could consider HRT as an alternative. Is that something that went into the decision making for surgery? Uh, I don't think that was discussed. Um, she was either combining a variety or a contraceptive before she didn't tolerate. Uh, now she's having to have to be seeking pregnancy now, but when she has no issues and she wasn't. Um, there's a nightmare question here, which is how you, how you handle PCO in the area with an incidental possible pituitary matter and over. So PCO causing in the area and the question is, what's the patient's BMI? And could this be, what would you do in a patient with a combination of PCO and a micro Because you can get a moderately raised prolapse, sorry, you can get a moderately raised prolapse with PCOS, I guess, as well. Can't you? Uh, yes, I think so. And, and also, a lot of people have a little tiny black over. Yes, test stretch for service time. Mean, I might have one, no one's ever come up with So, um, so how do I handle this difficult conundrum? This patient had a normal BMI. Had an all BMI, so it didn't look like a piece of your face, you think? Um, she'd also had an ultrasound scan, which deserved the criteria. She had a 
Yeah. Okay, the suggestion here about a progesterone challenge would be a good idea. Oh, well, Mouse's point was really well made a few points ago, which is that she did have three years of amenorrhea, didn't yeah. she? So she actually already has a lot going on in terms of, I'll just say, whatever the cause of the hypoglycemia is, you'd want to restore menses. Would yeah. you, that's your fundamental target? Uh, I think the discussion's gone slightly towards the advice and guidance discussion as opposed to. It's good, this case. that's why. Okay, right. Okay. Any other questions? Do you questions from the microphone? It's just a comment because I think that historically we all treated the production resistance um, medication and all the scare around the side effects and the increased side problems. So it's been wonderful to see revisit surgery for the occasional patient that's run into problems um, with uh, some of the impaired and past control problems. And um, this is slightly different, but she was obviously intolerable to other reasons. Um, so well done surgeons, but I still think the medical management is fantastically useful. <laughs> also just a comment to say that the clever scanning done at Cambridge is fascinating. We've got the luxury of having these joint MDTs where they go through it, but you really need to be seeing it in, in um, situ, going through it dynamically, because you can all collect one picture that looks good, but remember normal pituitary tissue can light up. So it really needs to be looked at with the specialist team, and I think it is still quite research driven at the moment, but it'll be really interesting to see where we end up with that. Thanks. And we're very lucky to have one of our neuro radiologists um, uh, here today who might be able to take uh, questions later about that. Yes, perfect, thank you. And I guess, yes, those large series uh, of surgery and Proactinomas, the microproactinomas, of course, always achieve better remission, and there is about 40% recurrence rate. So, not that I'm minimising the role of surgery, I'm just saying that we do have an effective medical agency for those patients who can tolerate it. Okay, I'm going to go on to the next speaker. Very much. So our next speaker is Dr. Wisman, who is going to talk to us about a case uh, of a macular member who is suspected apoplexy. Mm -hmm. Dr. Wisman mm -hmm. is from the doctor. Can you take a seat? Is that better? Yeah, now I'll just take it. There is some mentimeter, so, so get, get yourselves yeah. ready again. Hello, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Can you just press the button once? This one? Green. Just press the side button once. Right. Side. Sorry. Right. Hello? Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Dr. Bisma. I'm one of the endocrine registrar at Doug Ford and Gift Shamanagist Trust. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to present my case. It's about a pituitary macroadenoma with suspected epilepsy. So, we had a 31 year old gentleman who was an electrician by profession. He presented to ANE on 28th of Feb with sudden onset of severe bitemporal retroorbital headache, photophobia, and blurred vision of two days duration. He denied any fever, vomiting, or weakness of his arms or legs. In addition, there was no significant past medical history. We did his examination, which was normal. Otherwise, he was alert with normal vital signs and new scores of two, the new score of zero. Both the pupils were equal and reactive to light. His eye examination has revealed that he had some left-sided non parietic binocular diplopia with accompanying left temporal visual field effect. His neurological examination was otherwise normal. There were no features of meningism. In addition, there were no features of pituitary hormone deficiency or excess as well. Just his BMI was 34. Here are the tests. The initial baseline investigations were completely normal. We did the pituitary hormone profile, and you guys can see that cortisol, FSH, LH, prolactin, TSH, testosterone, all of them are low. So this indicates that the patient's pituitary profile has shown that the, uh, there is partial anterior hypopituitarism for which we have initiated him on hormone replacement in the form of levothyroxine, 
testosterone gel and hydrocortisone. We did the CT, uh, the imaging based on the headache, with the acute onset of the headache. We did the CT with the suspicion of having a space occupying lesion or subarachnoid hemorrhage. But to our surprise, it came that this, there was no subarachnoid hemorrhage or there was no intracranial bleeding. Instead, there was a soft tissue lesion in the cellular cica, which was suggestive of a pituitary macroadenoma. As we can see in the images, in the image, in the center, we can find that there is a pituitary macroadenoma. So subsequently, we followed with the MRI. This is the MRI scan. On the left, we can see uh, ex axial image, which is T2-wetted MRI. And the, then there is sagittal view. We can see that there are some necrotic tissues as well. And now here, this is the coronal view showing that there is a sagittal view showing that there is a large pituitary macroadenoma with some signs of necrosis. This, uh, there was a mass in this mass in the cellular cica with 34 cross 22 cross 36 mm hyper intense mass with in, internal in, enhancement in post contrast study, which was causing compression on the optic chiasm and complete effacement of cellular cica. So, first two are T1 wetted images, and one on the left is T2 wetted MRI image. So, our impression was pituitary apoplexy based on the acute presentation and MRI findings. So I have a question here for the audience. At this point, what treatment you would have offered, whether you will go for conservative or hormone replacement, or you will go for emergency surgery? I'm just going to... I'm just going to... I'm just going to do it for two minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay, get your phones at all. Yeah. Okay, don't be shy because I know that already 70 people voted for the last couple, so well done. Um, what treatment you, would you have offered at this stage? You've only got two options. Um, I'm going to give you all 10. Yeah, wait, wait, wait. yeah okay. Was that too impatient? It's a bit too far. Oh, sorry. You can press 10 again, yeah, 9 again. Right. Now it's 10 seconds, sorry. Okay. But is that it? I can, I can lengthen now. it. You can have me got 94. Yes, is that all right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh gosh, that's a very. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so personal because we like this in our MD too all the time, aren't we, about emergency it's surgery or not? Really so you've got a very split audience. Mm -hmm. Let me just get you back to your talk. So, very nice answers. Most of them are in the favor. So, we will go for the MDT discussion. This patient was then referred to the pituitary MDT at King's College Hospital. Pituitary MDT happened on 6th of March, and the outcome was urgent PI review for the PIU review for clinical assessment, repeat biochemistry, and replace hormone deficiency, which we already did. Then they asked for the admission need and urgent visual assessment at KCH, and then they decided that the patient may need surgery. So based on the outcome of the MDT, we did the urgent ophthalmology review, which has confirmed optic nerve compromise from the pituitary macroadenoma. OCT examination showed bilateral nasal optic disc margin swelling, and Humphrey visual field testing showed bilateral subtle spirotemporal field effects. We can see in the images that there is various level of visual field effects. Next, the patient underwent transvenoidal resection of adenoma at King's College Hospital on 11th of March. So our management was within two weeks. Histopathology, histology has revealed remnants of viable tumor with extensive necrosis. The appearance were those of necrotic pituitary adenoma. There was staining, faint staining with SF1 and LH, which suggests that the adenoma was likely gonadotrophic in origin. And KI67 index was low in the necrotic adenoma while it was overexpressed in the granulation tissue. After the surgery, patient was rediscussed at pituitary MDT on 20th of March. Postoperatively, his vision was improved completely. He was being he was discharged on levothyroxine, hydrocortisone, and testosterone replacement as he was initially initiated. 
and the real discussion in the MGD planned out outcome that he need insulin stress test at three months time and follow up MRI in three months and then the endocrine clinic follow up at the same time duration. We followed this patient in our endocrine clinic at four months time. Uh, during this appointment, he was clinically well. We initiated growth hormone replacement for him based on the results of insulin stress test. Uh, in the meantime, he expressed his wishes that he wants to start family, for which we have referred him to fertility center for assisted reproduction. So his post-op recovery was favorable and ongoing hormone replacement therapy along with the assisted reproductive technique addressed his long-term health and reproductive needs. This is it. This is the post-op MRI we did. You can see that there is some fat taking at the site of the surgery. Uh, which, th these are T1 wetted images, which are showing loculated contents. They are saying hemorrhagic, but this is fat taking which they have done after the surgery. <laughs> Here I will conclude my, my presentation with the questions for the audience. Was it appropriate to refer the patient for emergency pituitary surgery at presentation? Would anybody do things differently? And second one, how often do patients presenting with headaches end up being diagnosed with pituitary adenoma or epilepsy during unselected acute medical care? Thank you so much. So this is a great presentation. And uh, it's a lovely question. I really like this um, question. I think uh, <laughs> the to And um, surgery for patients with epilepsy is sometimes very satisfying because quite often the tube is quite soft and comes very easily. But of course, it isn't, it isn't the only option. And I think it's really important that you explain to the patient that you could have the option of monitoring. Yeah. Because in natural history, it's going to be a work of treating receipts and lots of cases where that's happened. Um, and so there isn't often a really clear right or wrong answer, which is great, as long as you can counsel the patient appropriately. Um, and I imagine I probably would make the same decision. Um, I think for this young patient, obviously yeah. very anxious about visual compromise. Yeah. Um, and I think it truly really depends on the overall clinical improvement on the severity of visual deficit and progression. You know, if, it's, if it's at all progressive, that's very much, I would say, nudging into um, surgery. Whereas we get that with the presentation that it's stable, it's not changed actually from when it first had symptoms or then it's even a little bit better. Um, you can just I just want to challenge that and say yeah. it's very satisfying because the patient gets better anyway. I wanted to know, um, so you said you probably would have made the same decision. And I just, it was interesting to me that the pump droids didn't look, the vision films didn't look that bad, did they? But actually the OCT and the actual physical examination of the discs, it actually looks more unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if that's, I mean, we've obviously all got those criteria about, you know, visual acuity is impaired, that's particularly significant in terms of pros and cons of surgery. What particular part of it, you said that it was because they were young, what other aspects was it about the OCT findings and the vision that would push you towards surgery for that patient? Um, yeah, I think so. And what, it also just depends on how sort of disabling they're finding their symptoms. Just intuitively, we imagine more rapid reduction of the mass effect is giving them a better chance that that uh, neurological recovery, where that you know, is easy to prove definitively. Yeah, yeah. But, but I think mm -hmm. kind of just because we have that experience of many patients having a you know, swift improvement first off, but they might get in time with conservative management. But intuitively, it, it's I think it's easy to make that decision. And defrocate can be, you know, acute defrocate can be quite the same thing. Uh, well, I'll say they're quite, um, you know, detrimental for patients. Well, I guess just thinking about our 50 50 split on our mentality, you can see how um, to, how I decided to go. Um, what does uh, Mr. Mendoza think? Oh, Would you answer them? Any, you know, any. I'm, I'm sure, sure, I'm sure you will. Well, I told you all, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the analogy I always use is I think conservative management is absolutely fine. If things are getting worse, it's like called Aquinas, the um, massive bits. You don't necessarily set that way because they've got their neurodegenerative problems. Then they'll be treated as a little bit 
because I'm not trying to an electrician why my clubs are constantly in six seven wires. I think they've got a significant effect on maybe up to 24 48 hours. That's the kind of time. If they've got a, I mean, the obvious credit policy, the decompressed the credit policy is reasonable. It's like a foot job. We don't accept the foot jobs in the biggest products. We know they're catering and consented management. So the foot jobs are disability for you all, the government, you can't run with it. Then. And so it's pretty safe, as you say, it's very normally soft hemorrhagic tumors. You know, it's not a relatively straightforward thing to do. So. Yeah. Any other questions from the audience? Yes. 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 I agree with everything that uh, Amanda uh, said. Um, I think for the younger patients, I'm more inclined to operate. For the larger lesions that are compressing aortic aneurysm, I'm more inclined to operate. Um, we've had a few cases of small bleeds and kings that we have operated on and found the uh, tumor to be moderately aggressive. Um, so that patient probably would have come to uh, surgery eventually. And you know, we found out what the histology was because we operate. And when you don't operate, you never get histology. So, uh, especially with young patients, that's, I, I think that's a relatively soft indication to go ahead. Next Thanks very much. I was just going to ask, is it, is it different if it's purely a partial versus hemorrhage? I know, Green, you're arguing that hemorrhage may, things may settle and shrink down again. Mm -hmm. this, there was, uh, and also the value of the ACT, like they, they saw through, well, the clinical examination saw through this, but we, we do sometimes struggle to get actually full eye assessment. So actually, answer your comment is well made that the clinical um, flavour is of is quite often what we're going on, although we can write down to all the you know to a that we want these assessments are quite difficult to get. But my my narrow question was is is it is it does the imaging influence you as well whether whether there is just in function or in hemorrhage? Well that's a by and large not particularly no because I think they very similarly obviously um Soon out to point about potentially an education, maybe up more than a condition, I suppose, to do more so out of the final large. I think they pay very similarly. My decision may not be the same. No, there's a lot to discuss about the microphones, but I'll have to say that out. <laughs> Next microphone is fine. Oh, okay. Any more? I mean, I find it a really difficult, a really difficult one clinically, and I think Corinne's point right at the beginning that there was a prospective study looking at registry data, so it wasn't randomised. There's lots of bias in JCM early this year. If anyone saw that, there's three months, there's no difference in outcome between conservative and surgery. So I think our mint is perfect, isn't it? Because I think we know none of us are particularly clear, but I think listening to the surgeons certainly things sway people. Okay. Is there a stronger role for OCT to, 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 as a visual aid field assessment as well as a visual assessment? Uh, I think the surgeons have already answered this. This is one of the company that said that it could be such a good idea. Plus, they can't get more information or data points. This just gives you more ability to justify your search for a decision making. It's only, you know, just probably going back to the time to the same sort of principle. It just gives you a little bit more armor to justify your position. Just a point to your one of the questions you put up. So I think all of us are going to go to the we are reliant on our AE teams basically for making the initial diagnosis of these patients. Mm -hmm. By the time they get to us, we can sort of quantitate what we to do. But I think it's, it's important to make sure your AE teams have. Some guidance, and I try and make it really simple. So I say, you know, we've got cards, and if they're thinking about stuff like mood hemorrhage, and there's any visual sort of um, issues, then to think about, you know, pituitary apoplexy and to check all these other things. Because I think, um, you know, in your question about headaches, obviously, only see lots and lots of headaches. So yeah. it's just slightly um, important that we sort of try and assist them with 
was thinking about the duty epilepsy and the presentation is generally quite similar to somewhere else, but just with that additional visual data. Yeah. It is similar to any previous CSF epilepsy with both, can't you? So it's, I think I wanted to point you to your question up. It's slightly from the depends on the specialty of your person doing GIM that day, doesn't it? Because I think it's very much conscious it's probably up on your radar. And as Anna said, maybe. Uh, you need to just be reminding uh, ED regularly about this as, as a possible diagnosis. Can anything else on Zoom? No, that's all, that's well, thank you. Okay, so a couple of housekeeping things from me, and then I'll let our chairs finish. Uh, there's lots of you at the back, just for after um, tea and coffee, which is in a minute. There's quite a lot of space down here if you want to be a bit less squashed. Um, and then for those of you who've got talks in the next session, if you wouldn't mind coming and finding Crim or I in a minute to load them on, that would be fantastic. And then I'll hand it over to our lovely chair. Thank you. Thank you so much.